for exclusive Danger Close merchandise and all things Jack Carr, be sure to head over to jackcarusa.com. Get exclusive gear while it still lasts. That's jackcarusa.com. This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My upcoming novel, Only the Dead, hits shelves on May 16th and is available for pre-order right now. My guest today is the legendary Rusty Furman. Rusty spent 27 years in the British military, 15 of those with the SAS. He was one of the assault team leaders for retaking the Iranian embassy in May of 1980 at Prince's Gate. He's the author of two books, Go, 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 The SAS, The Iranian Embassy Siege, The True Story, and The Regiment, 15 years in the SAS. And now, without further ado, Rusty Furman. (laughs) Oh, man, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. That's not a problem. Oh, it's it's such an honor. Um, Read both of these. Thank you for putting this story down. Uh, so inspirational uh, on, on so many different levels. 27 years in the British military. I mean, wait, you couldn't do 28? What's, uh, what, what, 27 years, that's a long run. Yeah, it's a long, uh, when you look back on it, it's a big part of your life. Um, you know, starting at 15 and going all the way through is a big chunk. Yeah, 15. So that you, uh, what did you get? You get caught uh, stealing eggs or something like that, and they gave you a, a choice, uh, or they forced you to go into the, the military to that uh, Royal Artillery's Junior Leader Regiment? Yeah, well, I was only 15. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> when I went in, obviously it was um, a culture shock. <laughs> I'm a guy who had long hair, longer than yours is now. I can tell you that. And a Rolling Stones fan in those days. <laughs> Wasn't cut out for the military, I can tell you. But once I was in there at 15, um, <clears throat> my first three months, I wanted to buy myself out. Um, it cost me £50, UK pound all those years ago. But actually, I couldn't get my hands on £50. And because of that, that's why I'm here today. Jeez. I mean, that's, uh, so 565. So is that 1970? What, what year is this? Well, what year I joined? Yeah. That'd be 1965. 65. So yeah. did you have any World War II veterans, uh, that were still around at that time? No, I did. I didn't have an interest in the army. You know, um, I just wanted to be a sportsman. And I was quite small, actually. I was about five foot two, you know, skinny, you know. So I wasn't cut out for the military at that age. That's for sure. Definitely. Did uh, in your regiment, though, in that junior leader regiment, were there any World War II veterans still around? Um, There were, but I'd never met anybody. Mm. So, um, as I say, I didn't know much about the army, let alone anything else. Um, but in my day at that age, you know, it, it wasn't like it is today um, with veterans, you know, be, either being looked after like the states look after theirs, yeah. where in the UK, they don't really give a monkey's what happens to the <laughs> veterans. So, so I'm jealous of your guys and I'm shocked at the way I was treated. Yeah. Yeah. Especially at that, at that man that time back then um there was no 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 news news reels and new, no really uh real um information about special operations until you guys do the uh, the Iranian hostage rescue in 1980 yeah um social media yeah you can't do anything these days with social <laughs> media so a lot of it is trying to be kept under wraps but actually as you well know jack that you can keep so much and uh, but there's always some that will get out. Mm-hmm. And it's a story for people who want the stories. Yeah, you, know, you don't give too much information away. 
but there's a story there without having to do that. And if you can get the story out, then why shouldn't other people, you know, learn what's going on and why? Yeah. When did you find out about uh, special operations? Because uh, you're in there, you're in for a few years before you go to 29 Commando. And is that where you really start to learn about special operations? Yeah, when I went to 29 Commando, that was all I did before that, I'll be honest with you. I did some soldiering, a couple of tours in Northern Ireland and stuff. But I was in a, I was in a track suit. 90% of my time playing all the different sports and everything to get out of a uniform. <laughs> then one day I was speaking to some friends of mine and they said they were going for selection. Um, this is while I was in 2-9 Commando. So um, we all sort of joined up together and all put in for the same sort of course at that time. But I'd spent almost four years in 2-9 Commando and I was on the training wing, you know, teaching commandos to become commandos, you know, uh, getting the green berry and get a lot of satisfaction. But at the end of the day, Jack, it wasn't enough. Um, I had to go and do something else. And after nearly four years in 29 Commando is when I applied for um, selection to 2-2 uh, SAS in 1977, which... While I'm on the subject, I'll just mention, you may have heard of Bucky Burroughs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he was on my selection in 1977 in Hereford. That's crazy. He, and he spent the six months, five months, actually. He spent the five months of the summer through to November 1977 on selection with our guys to learn about the process when he finished that selection, Bucky Burroughs went back, met up with Charlie Beckwith, and Delta Force was formed from that selection that Bucky Burroughs went on. I don't know how many people know that, but I know it because I was on there, met the guy a few times, obviously, over the selection process. So it was actually a pleasure to meet him. Never met him since. But he went back and started Delta, and that's how Delta was started. Bucky Burroughs and Charlie Beckwith, as you probably know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Charlie Beckwith did either uh, an exchange or something in the early 60s. I want to say it was 63 or 65. And then he came back and he wrote a, a paper about special operations that he then dusted off in 1977 when Bucky comes back. And uh, and then they go on to, to form Delta. Um, I mean, you guys really were the foundational unit for every Western counter-terrorist unit in existence today? Yeah. Um, when I got there, it was a culture shock yet again of how this part of the army operated. And um, there I was in green uniform one day, and the next day I was in civilian clothes operating in different parts of the world, uh, doing a totally different job, a lot of time in counter-terrorism, um, for the training of counter-terrorism, all the bodyguard work, everything else. Totally different than when I joined at 15 and you no idea what was going on in the army. Yeah. But then I was with surrounded by good guys, I might add, you know, guys who passed selection, which made it much easier, especially when you have to rely on, you know, as you well know, the guy next to you to do the job. Yeah. Did you meet John McLeese uh, in 29 Commando? Did you guys go through selection together? Um, I met John. Um, actually, we joined the same commando course okay. in 73-4. He was in um, what they called then 5-9 Independent Commando, um, which was based in Plymouth. And I was in 2-9 Commando, Royal Artillery, based in Plymouth. And just one day, we ended up on the same um, commando selection in Plymouth prior to going through that and then onwards to uh, Limston to get the Greenberry at the same time, um, 74. So, and that's when I first met him. And then that's when I sort of stayed, same squadron, all the way through our service from then on, um, pretty much the best of mates, uh, you know, 
and certainly up until when he passed away in 2011. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. Did, uh, did selection give you any, any trouble? Um, I've read that you wrote the SAS beret is easier to get than it is to keep. Um, and did, uh, did selection give you any trouble? I just missed that last bit. Did selection for SAS oh, give you yeah, any trouble? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I've, I've always been very fit. Um, and I've played a lot of sport, as I said, but I've always kept myself fit. And coming straight from the training wing in 2-9 Commando, where I was out in the hills, everywhere, you know, training, everything was physical. <clears throat> when I got down to Hereford, I'd actually done the best part of three weeks pre-training up in the mountains, of, you know, call them mountains, they're not your type of mountains, but, you know, up in beacons. Um, getting myself ready for it. So from day one to the day I finished, uh, I'm not being big headed, but tired at times. Yeah. But actually I didn't get any problem for the physical side, you know, apart from the odd blister, um, which isn't even worth talking about, but you know, a lot of people did get a problem, but I was lucky I got through, but I trained for it to get through. I didn't just turn up like some people did. Gotcha. And then as part of that, you go to um, continuation training and then Belize. What is that like going to those, uh, doing that part of training? Well, the, the thing about the SAS is that selection is the first part of getting anybody who thinks they're in the SAS. And I've met them. It didn't last very long, I can tell you that. But anybody who thinks they're in the SAS and they've done the selection, it is suddenly mistaken. <laughs> Continuation on top of that being beaten up on the hills. When you go out, you know, to the jungle training, combat survival, interrogation, you name it, one after another, day in, day out, day in, day out for the six months. Um, that is where you... you if you switch off, they'll find you, they'll catch you, and you'll be gone. Mm. So you're always looking over your shoulder because there are seasoned SAS veterans who are actually on, like I was in the commanders, they're on the SAS training wing. Their job is to weed out, um, you know, people who are not suitable. Even though they pass the physical, it happens, you know, people are being removed all the time. So the one thing I had to do and knew this was actually never thinking I'd got that berry until I got it. And that was the thing that took me through. If I was there the next day, I knew I'd gone a little bit further. And my my motto was always a bit further, or a little bit further, yeah. either way. And that's what I did. So I worked, and the people who didn't work didn't last too long, I'm afraid. Yeah. Isn't that uh, always a little further? Is that on the the clock at Hereford? Is that, uh, is that is that is that always a little further on the clock at Hereford? Isn't there a uh, yeah memorial clock? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always a little further, you know, one that. foot front of the next, and never run until you can walk, basically. And then when you finally get there, you can look back and you can say whatever you want. But actually getting your berry is one thing and keeping it is another because there's been so many people once they passed, so that was it. Let the guard down, caught out, gone. Yeah. It was, you know, I don't know what it's like this day and age, but in my day, that's what it was like. Yeah. <laughs> um, everybody has done something and it's what you get caught doing is what you pay the penalty for. <laughs> that is the truth. Watch out. That's the truth. Yeah. Uh, it is the truth. Yeah, it is the truth. Uh, were you guys, when you were doing that continuation training, were you already using the MP5 at that point in 1977, 78? MP5s? Yeah. Were you already using those back in uh, 77, 78? Were those already in the system? Yeah, no. Um, I passed... Um, selection in 77 I'd used we do we used to do um, weapons training as well especially foreign weapons that was part of it 
and you'd have a shoot with this and a shoot with that. MP5s and nine millimeter pistols in my day were the primary and secondary weapons. That's you know, and I swear by them to this day. But that's only because I was used to them. So the MP5 training, you know, after past selection, you go to a squadron. Once you're in one of the four squadrons, every six months you, you swap over. So every two years for the four squadrons, if you like. Six months on this, six months on counter terrorist team, six months training, six months, um, so, you know, doing different skills, tra- call it what you want. But that would take you around the system in two years and you'd keep going around that system. Um, and that's where I got really um, well into the MP5s and stuff, which obviously you're going to talk about later. I can tell that. <laughs> You, you know, you so know. I can see that. Um, you can see it in my eye, yes. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, a great weapon. You know, I think well before it's time. Oh, and, yes. uh, see by the picture behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I swear by it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's an incredible photo. I don't know if I've seen that exact one before uh, sorry i don't know if sorry, i've seen sorry. i don't know if i've seen that exact one before i've seen a lot of uh pictures of sas particularly from pence's gate but uh i don't know if i've ever seen that one before behind you you haven't seen it i mean i've seen i've seen a lot of them but i don't think i've seen that exact angle it's supposed to be the iconic picture <laughs> yeah the, the, the one i, I have a a uh, a picture uh that's poster size of uh, you have it in here but uh it's the the world's best commercial for H and K. That one right there. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, that one right there. I have that framed. Of I you. Can't get, quite see that, Jack. It's the uh, well. It's the one. The two guys right there, all in black. You can see the MP5 right there on the balcony. Those two oh, guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But the, the the one behind me, the one you can see, is actually the synonymous one. It, that's me in the middle with no gloves on. Wow. As a team leader, I'd forgotten my gloves. So, but the police snipers took that picture. Wow. Um, and that's how I got to be known as Rusty, the guy with no gloves, really. <laughs> so uh, that's it. That's why I put it on there today. Oh, I love it. That's fantastic. I can't believe I've never seen that that picture. I've seen so many pictures and videos from this event, yeah. but I t- can't have yeah. not seen that angle. That's amazing. I'll make sure I email you a copy. Oh, through. thank you. That would be amazing. I'd be honored. Thank I'll you. Get, I'll get my fiance to do it. Perfect. Soon. Soon. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Is that I'll a send you one through my uh, oh, that... in... No, I've sent one. Um, she sent one to Jessica. Already. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Make sure you get it off of me. I will. Oh, well, amazing. Amazing. Is that a flashlight on the top of that MP5 right there? Is it? Yeah, that's torch, um, a torch. That is the most Mickey Mouse setup. That, that was the best kit we had. Okay. That, that is um, a, a mag light. And the bit you can't see is where the wires are coming out of it down onto a battery. Uh, so that when you wanted to put it on in the dark, you could push this. Two wires would come together, basically, and light up. And once you let go of the little button, it would go out again. And that's what it was like. That was the best kit we had in the counter-terrorist team in 1980. Wow. Until after the siege. Mm. things changed. Got it. Got it. Uh, So before 1980, you went through... Uh, two rotations that you were talking about. So you went, did you go through Northern Ireland twice with SAS before Princess Gate? Um, Altogether, I did did quite a few tours of Ireland, some before I ever got into the SAS, and then quite a few um, after I got into the SAS. It was part of the system. Um, So, yeah, we did quite a few uh, tours uh, over the years. What are your memories of uh, working in Northern Ireland? Yeah, well, I enjoy. I, I had a lot of good um, friends out there, actually, you know, um, and I got on very well with them. But the actual soldiering side of it, again, I spent most of my time, as people know nowadays, in civilian clothes, um, doing all sorts of jobs there, which were interesting more than anything. Mm. And to find out what was happening 
in the political side, in the background, which sometimes you never find out because soldiers told to do something nine times out of ten, they go and do it because they're being ordered to do it. My day, I would be told to do something. I'd certainly think about how I was going to do it, um, like a lot of the guys, and then get the job done. Mm -hmm. A totally different way of soldiering. Um, and, you know, I enjoyed what I did. And, you know, at the end of the day, it was a job that had to be done. Recently on Change Agents with Andy Stumpf, an Ironclad original from executive producer Jack Carr. Andy spoke with someone on the front lines of the war against international sex traffickers, Sentinel Foundation founder Glenn Devitt. It will be the hardest thing you've ever done. The second you fucking pull a kid out and they start crying, and then you start crying, yeah, there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing better. Never miss an episode. Subscribe to Change Agents with Andy Stumpf wherever you get your podcasts and get the full cinematic experience on YouTube at This Is Ironclad. All right, today I want to talk about Protect.com. That is P-R-O-T-E. KT.com started by my buddy, Nick Norris from the SEAL teams, who was recently on the podcast. He's all about health and wellness and living that best life. So what we have here, hydration, immunity, energy, rest, liquid packs, because we all want to feel our best. We dream of waking up with plenty of energy to excel at our work, our personal lives and have a great workout every single day. But the reality is, very few of us do that. That's why Protect was started. And you can grab a convenient pack right here. This is energy. So this has been boosting me through my latest novel. And look at that, it's a liquid pack right there. You just, bam, add it to a glass, add a little water, and you are good to go. So hydration, love the hydration, and the immunity, and the clarity, which I'm gonna take as soon as this podcast is over and I get back to writing. So all of that plus the rest. How important is that rest? Right here, take that an hour and a half before bed for some great sleep. And for hydration right here, 30 minutes after you wake up and right before your workout. So swap that daily energy drink for the energy, try that hydration, that immunity, that rest. And they also have products like this, Reef Safe Sunscreen, SPF 50. Protect right there. And right now you can get 25% off. Go to protect.com. That is P R O T E K T.com slash danger close for 25% off. Go check them out. Now, when you're on that rotation and you get word that something is happening at Prince's Gate, um, are you uh, at Hereford? Are you on leave? When do you get? Uh, brought in? Like when does B Squadron get alerted that there's something going on at Princess Gate? Was that? Uh, sorry, yeah. Okay, I've got a bit of a delay here. Um, basically, it was a bank holiday in 1980. And um, the bank holiday in UK, obviously, was it's called the May Bank Holiday, the early May Bank Holiday. And it just happened to be the 30th of April, um, which is a Wednesday. And we were ready to go on an exercise over the bank holiday anyway, um, secret exercise, but we all knew it was going to be the north of England. <laughs> they killed the forest area. They're pretty remote up there. Mm. But we were ready to go on an exercise, basically. And the way it started... Um, everybody was doing whatever they would normally be doing in and around Hereford, knowing that at some stage the pages would go off. And that would be, depending on what numbers come up on the pager, would be dependent on what they want you for. Um, we were just expecting the exercise call out when, in fact, we got the four nines, you know, nine, 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 which was operational in them days long since changed but um it was like you know scratch the head but actually when we got in the idea is to get into work as fast as you can some people lived very close to the camp the old camp 
Some people lived out in and around Herefordshire. Uh, normally, you'd have like 30 minutes to get in um, before you got the first briefing and stuff. And mine just went off. And like everybody else, we all went into camp. But with no social media, no news, really, we were dependent on one or two people to be getting the information for you what had happened. Cut a long story short, once the guys were in, we had a briefing, which I could give you in like three seconds, because nobody knew what was going on. But basically, hang on here in camp. The command group will disappear and you'll be informed. That was half past 11 in the morning, something like that. And then the odd little snippet came on the news, but nothing, you know, if you saw the news, that was. And then um, it was a matter of um, hurry up and wait, really, as we called it, you know, hang around. Somebody's going to tell you something when it's ready. We hung around most of the day before we realised that um, there was an incident down at Princess Gate. But the incident, um, even then, we didn't know who was involved in it, how many, but it was an operation rather than an exercise. And that made all the difference to everybody. You know, all of a sudden you got an exercise, but then within minutes it's changed to an operation. Yeah, your mindset just changes totally because you want to know what it is. And I was no different. You know, I, I wanted to know what was going on. And that's how it all started. So we spent the first few hours without a clue, no idea of what was really happening. A little bit of a news, uh, one of the guys down in London phoned up the colonel, give him, because he was in the police now rather than the SAS, he'd been in the SAS, gone out, and he was with uh, Terminal 4 Heathrow, uh, with the dog section there. He did something on the radio and passed it through. And that was really the first part of any real substance that we got. Uh, there was definitely something happening but we'd only find out in time. And that's how it started. Once everybody was in, all ready to go. It's just now a matter of where we're going and when we're going. Wow. And that's how the first day started. Jeez. I mean, that's amazing. And in the book, I love how you break it down in, uh, in this book by, by days. Uh, day one, day two, day three, yeah. day four, day five. Day six. Um, it's incredible. I mean, there's been movies made about this. Who Dares Wins? Uh, when I was growing up, uh, uh, that was the one that came out in 1983. Recently, we have the Netflix movie, Six Days, that came out. But there's so much in here that I didn't know. Uh, so thank you for writing this. Everybody should read this. It's amazing. Um, when do you start to get intel on who these guys are? Do you know how many are in the embassy? Do you know that they're uh, Iranians on Iraqi passports and how they got their <laughs> weapons and what weapons they had? How do you start building the intel before you guys go in? Well, nobody knew how long it was going to last. Um, that's the first thing. You know, day one is day one. Um, so you start planning for the operation as soon as you get your first information, really, intelligent. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, when we got finally down there as a t two teams within the squadron, red and blue team, when we finally got there, it was a long hike on day one. It started at 11 o'clock in the morning. We never actually got into Regent's Park Barracks, which is the holding area in the time, for 12 hours. And that was with the slow drive to London, not the blue flashing lights and stuff. It was, you know, more, let's keep it covert and hope the paparazzi don't, you know, catch, catch in on it. And that's why it was all taken. It took a long time. You'd think 12 hours, you know, I could have flown over to Los Angeles and halfway back by that from the UK, you know. So that's how long it took to get 200 miles into London via a certain place where we had a, a bit of a briefing. Mm. When we got there... <clears throat> We still had to wait, my team, another 24 hours. But this, that night we got there on the, the evening of the 30th, 
red team, the other team from what I was in, disappeared down to London, down to the embassy and got in next door, um, the Royal College of General Practitioners, which is next door, the embassy itself, which is number 16. The, the, the doctor's house, as I call it in the book, that was 14, 15. So you couldn't get any closer, but they got there covertly. And we had half a squadron next door. But at that stage, we still didn't know. And we were down at Regent's Park, which is four and a half miles down the road in London traffic, if it were needed, <laughs> um, because we couldn't all get in there together. So we were just hanging about, waiting, you know, you know what it's like, you're just waiting to, to go to do something. But in fact, you sat around cleaning your weapons. How many times can you clean a weapon? You know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, but that's that's what happened. And then, you know, they red team put a skeleton plan together with very limited information and intelligence. They put a plan together and um that was the formation of the, the plan to start with. By the end of the six days, with all the extra intelligence and, you know, uh, hostages being released, get some information off them, police snipers, uh, SAS snipers, all getting little bits of information, taking pictures of terrorists at the window and stuff. He built up the picture, you know about that. And that's exactly what we did. And the one guy who didn't get enough credit for me is a guy called Max Vernon, the head negotiator. Um, he made sure that even though he thinks he was a failure, he made sure that we had six days to plan and prepare to go and rescue the 19 hostages that were left with six terrorists. So... That's what Max did. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, but he did that, and I don't think he ever got the credit that he deserved. Mm. And he, he was a failure because he was a head negotiator. He could have negotiated an end to the siege, you know. But in fact, it went beyond that, and that didn't happen, which we'll probably come on to in a bit. Yeah. Did you know that if they executed a hostage that you guys were going to go? Was that always going to be the trigger? Uh, if they executed someone and tossed them out a door or a window, whether it was day two or three or four that you guys were going to go? Well, the guys are trained in the job, aren't they? And they're the last line, even though people say you should be the first line. Because a lot of people don't realize, you know, you're holding up the go, go, go there. That... Mm -hmm. It was a police operation from start to finish, apart from the last 15 minutes. So we were there to support the police, okay? The police were negotiating. Everybody's there. It's a police operation. You know, we know that there's six terrorists. There were 25 hostages to start with. A couple got out. And the guy you're talking about... Lavasami is only a young lad. And he was the press attache to the Iranian embassy. So this guy, Faisal, the bully, the second in command of the terrorists, we found out later, he's the guy who executed Lavasami and fired three shots at him while he was tied up on the stairs. Don't forget that these terrorists, whether you know it or not, you should do, but they were um, Saddam Hussein backed terrorists from Iraq um, because of the plight that was going on in Arabistan, which is in just over the border from Iraq in Iran. And of course, you know, uh, Hussein sent six guys across. And you know what? If they had given themselves up on day one, they'd have gone to jail. They got so much publicity, but they kept on the second day, day three, day four, day five, day six. And all they were doing was digging themselves a hole, really. When in fact, you know, they were never going to go get away with it. Maggie Thatcher, the prime minister, far too strong. Still the best one I've worked under. Not everybody thinks the same, but I'm not, I don't really care about that. As far as I'm concerned, she is the best 
and she didn't take any mucking about from anybody. As soon as they executed Lavasani, it took her 16 minutes to get into position, and then 11 minutes um, from go, go, go to rescuing the hostages in that building. Wow. Well, you know, that is, uh, you know, the way it happened. Yeah, there's a lot more to it than that. But just taking you through what you asked me, that is, um, that's the way it was. Yeah. And it started proof of murder on UK soil, if you like. That is it. They uh, executed Lavasani. He didn't do anything more than poke his chest out at the terrorists. Mm. But what did they do? Tie him to the stairs and shoot him three times. Yeah. And body outside the building on the steps, right in the public eye, in front of all the cameras, proof of murder. Did you did you hear it? How did you find out that they had executed a hostage? Well, there were shots fired in the embassy. But at that stage, there have been shots fired <clears throat> prior. Mm. Uh, now, nobody could say whether that was somebody being executed, somebody shooting into the floor, into the ceiling. So at that stage, it was still in negotiations. <clears throat> Only for the fact that as ready as we were to go, and we were ready, um, you couldn't be any more ready than we were, but there was no proof of murder. So it was still being negotiated and it was still a police operation supported by the SAS, supported by the SAS. So they were still negotiating and that was the early shots. Then when the three shots uh, rang out, and they put the body outside on the doorstep. That was just inviting, really, us guys in. Because the the famous words, I think, that Max used, that Max Vernon, well, it's a whole new ball game now, Salim, the leader. Mm. And it was. Wow. Wow. So what happens when you guys get that order to go? Um, do you have to move up? into position or do you already have guys staged uh, on the roof or uh, how did it, how did it go from there? I know it's about a 17 minute operation. Uh, and I know John McLeese is doing the, the, uh, the demo using a, I think a Claymore clacker uh, with his, uh, so, to breach. Um, how does all that? And some guy, another guy's foot goes through a window. Um, Cause a lot of people think of this operation. They, they think of it going like clockwork and there, nothing goes wrong. And that's what it looks like from the outside. But when you're there and you know, all operations have something that goes wrong and you have some tangled ropes, a boot, boot through the window, all sorts of things start happening. Um, what is it like from, from after that go, 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 and getting into position? Jack, you've just given me a flashback, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Flashback in time. Seriously. No, um, after the after the executed Lavasani and threw him outside on the set, he was picked up, taken away, proof of murder. Maggie Thatcher, as I said, um, the, the police had to hand control over to the SAS now because it wasn't, it was out of their hands. Mm. They don't want the word. So uh, Dello, the head police guy, he then handed the control to Mike Rose, who was our colonel. Mike Rose got him to sign a bit of paper to say, you know, it's now, yeah, <laughs> sign that. <laughs> um, so they did that and then very quickly, it was passed over to us, B Squadron 2 to SAS, who were carrying out the operation. And of course, um, once it was handed over to us, we knew where we were going. Everybody, you know, I can give you a breakdown. It depends how much time you've got. But Please. I know, as a team leader, how many people went into that building. Okay. And actually, on the go, 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 it took us, as I say, from getting the word of, you know, it's now the B squad an operation, get into your final assault positions. That included the roof, the front, 
the back of the building. Obviously, we couldn't go in the sides because it <laughs> adjoined to the embassy. So everything had been taken care of. And you've heard of multi-entry, multi-entry points all over the building, which means if one or two get held up or stuck, you've got others at the same time. Someone, somebody's going to make it to go in and achieve the mission, which incidentally was to rescue the hostages. That was the mission, to rescue the hostages. So with everybody knowing where they were going, some abseiling, as you've said, from the roof. I think you call it repelling, don't That's it? right. So That's right. Abseiling over there, I know. <laughs> but it's the same thing. So we had guys going down from the roof down to the second floor at the back of the embassy. We had John Mack, as you quite rightly mentioned, and the three other guys, um, they were on the front balcony. My team were at the back. It was 10 of us, including the four that were going in the, the basement. And people think, wow, I'm, you know. And then there were the other teams, there were the reserve teams outside, and we've had the odd person who, you know, we've had the 10,000 people on the balcony. Well, in fact, once we got into position, that was 16 minutes, but it had to be done covertly. And as you say, the boot through the window on the second floor, that was a total slip. They were above the window waiting to go down and go in the door. The boot just clinked through the top window. That alerted Salim, the head of the terrorists. He knew that something was going on, but Max was trying to say to him, don't worry, nothing is going on, nothing is going on, nothing. And then boom. And then everybody made their entry through their entry points. Once that was done, and um, there was no going back then, obviously, because it was probably, I call it a semi-compromise, and quite got in, but we were there. So fractions of seconds, you know, and then we've got the go, 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 as it says in your book there. We've got the go, go, which was a code word. Everybody had their jobs to do. I was team leader now of the blue team. We had the red team. They went in from the top of the building down to the middle and finally down to the ground floor. My team went in the ground floor up to the middle of the building and then finally back down and out the back door. Well, for all the people who say they were there, there's only actually on the day 32 people, guys, my guys, red and blue team, actually entered that building on the go, go, go to rescue the hostages, 32. It was 60 odd on the operation, um, 67, I think. Um, we had guys outside on the reserve team and stuff, all part of the operation. Um, to help with the hostage evacuation. Um, so me and my team, the red team, went inside and mission rescue the hostages. And that's exactly what we did. And in doing that, we killed five terrorists and um, one terrorist got out, but we did rescue all 19 hostages alive. Um, and that took 11 minutes to clear 56 rooms fully by 32 of us on six floors, that's including the basement where there was no entry to the basement from the outside of the building. So what I'm saying is that um, 32 guys, the other guys were there to assist, quite rightly needed as part of the operation. If we'd had some, some, some more casualties, then we had a reserve team there outside, ready to deploy if required. It was never needed. <clears throat> but they were there. That was part of the big plan. So we had a plan A, plan B, plan C, probably plan D and all the rest <laughs> of it. Well, you, you know what I'm talking about, being an ex-Navy SEAL. And, of course, that's um, that's what we did. And, of course, at the end of it, that 11 minutes, um, yeah, the place was on fire. There was gas everywhere from the flashbangs, Um the shooting, there was people being sick in there, there was people screaming, there was quite a few females in there as well, um, slipping and sliding on the stairs, mainly because the, the glass dome had been blown into the building, and glass on carpet didn't go too well, you get on that, it could slip, 
And of course, that was it. Hostage evacuation is and was the next part. So, you know, I can take you through that, what happened then as well. But at the moment, we got to the point of being there. The plan was to do what exactly what we did, semi-compromise. From that, go back to the original plan. Yes, we had problems, but the guys, we've got two um, two things I always say. You guys are flexible and adaptable. If an obstacle comes up that you're not expecting, you don't ask your senior rank, is it okay? What you do is you do the job, and at the end of it, you get a pat on the back, you get a kick in the backside. But you haven't got time. You've got to think on your feet. And them two words, I think, would stand many in good stead. Don't, you've got a plan, but you know what? It's never going to go to plan. There's always going to be something in the unforeseen. You have to cater for that and deal with that. Yeah. That, nothing, nothing's changed over the years. It, uh, <laughs> it's still yeah, that if way. You, if you want me to take you through the hostage evacuation, at the moment, we're inside the building. You can imagine the carnage, you, you know, um, you can't hear anything on your radios. You couldn't hear a thing, you know, because of what was going on in there. And what you're trying to do is rescue the hostages. You know that there's six terrorists in there, but you don't know where they are. So you've got teams on each floor. And um, the good news is that the floors that we expected most of the action on actually became reality. Mm. The middle of the building, really, <clears throat> and the ground floor. Okay. So that was the crux of that. And as you can imagine, all the guys are meeting obstacles, meeting terrorists, meeting hostages, and trying to get them out of the building at the same time. Um, and that's the way it was on the day. And if you want us to go through the hostage evacuation now, from that, I'll just carry on if you want. Well, I was going to ask you, so I was I figured that the radios weren't working too well once you were inside the building. Um, and so I figured there was confusion there. Uh, are you hearing the gunshots from the other guys? Uh, what are you, as a team leader, what are you processing as you're clearing this structure when you're counting bullets, counting, counting rounds maybe, uh, seeing a couple terrorists? dead before you get to your final encounter there. I want to talk to you about that. But are, what do you know? What is your situational awareness like of what's happening on those floors? Um, well, it's different. You know, I'm, I'm glad there's no radio contact, I'm be honest with you, because you could hear um, the odd message trying to come through, what's happening, this. You know, you haven't got time to do that. So... I'm just glad that there was a problem with the radios. Mm. You know, the, the fact is that that's exactly what happened in that building. But most people had a problem. But you can imagine in 11 minutes to get through that lot, all those floors, and find those people and eliminate the five terrorists, <clears throat> you know, um, and then rescue the 19 hostages, but get them out safely as well into the back garden area behind the um, embassy itself. <clears throat> you weren't bothered about radio stuff. You, you know, you can't fix anything on the radio. <laughs> yeah. When you can't, can you? Um, that, that really is, you know, that's what happened. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that that's only up until the, the part where we've gone into each of the rooms and the guys have met you, the terrorists and including the one I've got, if you want to speak about him, I'll tell you about him as well. Yes, I love that. He was the he, wasn't he the second in command? Who the guy that you end up uh, stitching up at the yeah, end? I didn't I didn't know at the time he was second in command, but I didn't know he was a terrorist. Um, and he still had the jacket on and everything, which was a dead giveaway, uh, an olive green jacket. But whilst everything was going on, and yeah, inside the building. Um, where we were on the ground floor and the stairs leading up to the first floor was a classic. If anybody was going to come out, our team had to come out of there. The red team had to come out of there. The hostages had to come past us. 
you know, everybody had to come past us because there was nobody on the ground floor when we got in, mm. completely clear. So we, they were on the first floor upwards, first, second, <clears throat> third floor. And then it sort of petered out a little bit between the ground floor, first floor, and second floor. That was it. So, but you didn't know that because you couldn't hear anything. All you could think of is you're going to achieve the mission, right? And um, as the time went on and people were coming by, hostages, terrorists, um, there's only, I don't know how one of the terrorists got past me, but he got past quite a lot of people. We suspect it was Stockholm Syndrome. You know what that is, don't you? Yep. Stockholm Syndrome with the females took a like to the lad. He's only a young, 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 young fella. And they took a like to him. And it looks like he probably got out with them. Don't know. That's what it looks like. To this day, I don't know. Um, but at the same time, Faisal, who I didn't know at the time, is the one who killed Lamassani. And he was the whole reason that the assault took place, really, proof of murder. But I did know when he got to me coming down the stairs and the guys upstairs were shouting and pointing, the people on the stairs, there's not much they could do. But I was still on the stairwell on the way down. That there was something I could do if I needed to. When he come down, looking away over the banister, trying to pull a jacket over his head, when everybody else just wanted to get out of the building. It's really that that just caught my eye and took it towards him. But when I actually grabbed hold of him to see who he was, he had the green jacket on. You couldn't miss his face and his hair, that green jacket and the grenade, of course, and then spun him round. But when I spun him round, my mate Snapper smacked him on the head anyway. And then I just fired my MP5 at him a couple of times. And he fell to the bottom of the stairs. But lucky for us, the pin was still in the grenade. But he was still a threat to the team, and he was still a threat to everybody else, the hostage and terrorists. So it is that quick, you know. Mine was as quick as holding him, turning him round, and pushing him away at arm's length. It was that close. Um, but that's, like I said, that's the decision you have to make. And that's what you get trained to do. Hence, you're going back to before about the MP5 and the training. Mm -hmm. The training that kicks in. Um, but you don't have that much time to ask questions or, you know, you've got to make those decisions. And at the end of the day, it was the right decision. Wow. So, you know, the, the rest went on, went outside. But the good news is, um, all the hostages got out. That's so amazing. Was, I mean, imagine if he pulled that pin on that grenade. Well, yeah, it, I mean, you could expect that maybe he had that in his hand with the pin out already, and even if he dropped, it would, it would go off. Who knew? Mm. <clears throat> the fact is, it's something you do, isn't it? You know, it's just split. You haven't got time to think about it, really. Yeah. got to do something. Um. It's as quick as that. What, um, I mean, that's, in, that's incredible. Um, and then one of your other teammates, uh, Palmer, he had somebody uh, in his sights. I think he pressed the trigger, has a misfire, goes for his browning, and the guy runs out. What happened with Palmer and his engagement with the terrorist? So was that Tommy you were on about? Uh, P-A-L-M-E-R, Palmer. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, he, he was on the floor above, actually. Um, I think it was near the telex room, as they call it. But you're right, he, you know, the, you don't want a stoppage on the weapons. <laughs> um, and certainly you don't want one when somebody's in front of you. <laughs> but he did get a stoppage. Um, but he, he drew out his um, backup weapon, secondary weapon, if you like, the 9 millimeter Browning. And then um, from there, he persevered after him. But he did have a stoppage, yeah, <clears throat> which were very few and far between, I have to say, on that weapon, because yeah. it's such a weapon. Um, you know, I swear by them to this day. I would. Yeah. But, yeah, he, but he, yeah, he did well, and um, he, he chased them and uh, caught them. 
Amazing. That's, did that's the, what happened. Did, uh, did the terrorists also, did they put um, uh, some sort of linen or blankets or newspapers and douse them with gasoline? Was that part of it as well? Um, I didn't come across that. Um, but what was very clear is that um, the curtains and stuff on the second floor caught light um, very quickly. And rumour has it, I haven't spoken to the guys, um, that there was, yeah, there was um, some form of something on there because when the flashbangs were thrown in, um, you know, they send out their little screamers, um, call them what you want, you know. Um, but they'll set fire to something um, if it's the wrong material, let's say. But if it's got the likes of anything on there, petrol, kerosene, whatever, mm -hmm. set light. But what did appear to happen is that the the, the curtains and everything, because I could see curtain, uh, from the outside, the curtains and everything were catch light very, very quickly. Well, they had to go through that to get into the building. And, of course, all the kit that we have or had um, <laughs> burnt. <laughs> you know, you got rubber boots, you got cotton coveralls, mm. you got um, Mickey Mouse gloves. We didn't have good kit and equipment, I can tell you that. Mm. It wasn't until after that operation when they sat back and went, so all of a sudden, this Gucci stuff come out, you know, this <laughs> no mix fireproof. And, right. But we didn't have any of that. What we had is normal, um, you know, pilot's gloves. Oh, what's a counter-terrorist doing with pilot gloves, you know? Yeah. Helicopters. Right. But that's what we had, you, you know. Probably that's why I threw mine away, but... Uh, <laughs> Probably. Uh so as a team leader, when do you find out that, uh, get the call that, hey, uh, all's clear, everybody's okay? What? How does that, how do you find out after this 17-minute assault uh, that everybody's okay, hostages are accounted for, one terrorist captured, others dead? How do, how do you put that together near the end of the operation there? Well, as I said at the beginning, that the idea was to do multi-entry room that means you get as many bodies into different parts of the building. <coughs> the word I use is simultaneously. So, and if you can do that, uh, you might get the other one hung up here and there for whatever reason. But once they started going in and clearing through the building, the idea even to um, the plan we had that to come downhill eventually and out the back door um, where there are no cameras and stuff, very, very few. Um, not like the front of Princess Gate, which was shrouded in, um, you know, newsreels and paparazzi. So our our idea on the plan was whatever happened, the guys that come in at the top and the bottom are going to meet somewhere. You just turn around, obviously, when you get there. But everybody came out, and that included hostages and stuff. They all shepherded down the stairs. Then they were grabbed hold of them, identified, male, female, taken out through the back door, passed on to the grass where the reception team was. They would then separate the males and females, terrorists, hostages, and they would start to plastic cuff them. You know the plastic cuffs? Mm -hmm. you know, um, that's what we call them anyway. So they would separate everybody in the garden. That was the reception team's job identifying who was who. They identified one terrorist, put him to one side, identified the Iranian men, Iranian women, uh, Chris Kramer, uh, was it Chris? Not Chris Kramer. Um, our, our, uh, there was a couple of the BBC guys in there. And so everybody got separated on that big green bit of grass at the back and were separated um, and then counted, obviously, to see how many they had. They were the last, the top team come down through our team on the bottom. As I said, we went in the back door. Um, so it was quite obvious. <clears throat> we have control of the downstairs. So everybody come down out the back. Then the red team, what was left of them, come down 
they went through our team and out the back, following the horses and um, on terrace. And then eventually we then peeled off ourselves um, because it was set, you know, the place was burning. <laughs> you know, we must stay around there too long. And then we'd follow out the rest of that, making sure everybody, we got outside ourselves. Once I got out, with the last, I was the last one out the door anyway. Um, but once we got outside, then the two teams sorted themselves out on the grass behind where all the horses and terrorists were, terrorists. Once we got onto that grass, and that was, um, you know, account, start accounting people. Only people that were missing were five terrorists. <laughs> so um, that was good news for us. That's five percent still in the building. And um, all of us were outside. The hostages and terrorists have all been separated. They've been accounted for, which meant there was nobody left in the burning building apart from the terrorists or ex-terrorists <laughs> that was it wow and you know after that the the, the, the fire brigade were there and everybody else scenes of crime were turning up you know because it's done properly <clears throat> you know um they had to, scenes of crime had to go in and see what happened and everything else and then from that we all went we went our way you know, uh, say the guys in black went our way back to um, back next door. That was the holding area. Um, that's where all our kit was in bags. We all got changed. We all <laughs> actually tried to find out who was winning the snooker at the time. <laughs> we, we were interested in the snooker. And uh, I always remember there was an Irish policeman there, really nice guy. He couldn't believe that we were talking about snooker when we just finished an operation. And that's what we did. And once we packed up and everything, let the air dust settle a little bit, and then we all got in our vehicles, the small vehicles, and the police drove us back to um, Regions Park Barracks, where all our Range Rovers and everything else were all parked up there. That was four and a half miles away from, <clears throat> from the embassy. Mm. Got in there, we had a debrief. Maggie Thatcher come along with Dennis Thatcher, with William Whitelaw, the Home Secretary. They all showed up, um, said their thanks and everything. We just packed our stuff. We'd already given our weapons in straight away. They were bagged up and tagged. They went straight to forensics mm. that night. Um, and then we drove back to Hereford. Um, Stopping for um, a burger on the A417, Sound and Sister. I've tried to find it recently with, um, with Alfie, and um, we couldn't find it, but it's still there. I know that. <laughs> and I think I think they've changed the roads around since I was there. Yeah. We went up there, and um, from there, we all just moseyed back in our own time. No rush, no <laughs> lights, no nothing. Um, Backed up unloaded the vehicles and then um, showed up the next morning um, for a briefing and a couple of days off while we went to do, um, you know, our statements and everything. So they gave us a couple of days off <clears throat> because one, we didn't have any weapons <laughs> um, because they were at forensics, but they were back very quickly and um, made a couple of days off. Amazing. Uh, and back to work. Wow. Incredible. Um, had you met Margaret Thatcher before? I know she had a close relationship with the SAS. Um, was that your first time meeting Margaret Thatcher? Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, I missed that, Jack. Was that your first time meeting Margaret Thatcher? I know she had a close relationship with the SAS. No, no, I've met her quite a few times, actually. I've got pictures with her and stuff. Um, I, I just thought, she, you know, you know, when you meet somebody, you think, if we need it, she's there. Mm -hmm. But she was. It's not like we, you know, what we've had lately. We'd still be there now trying to talk <laughs> our way. Oh, my um, gosh. Yeah. For me, she was the best. So, 
Amazing. The Iron Lady. The Iron Lady. Did she go around and say hi to, to every single SAS member in that room? Um, probably not everybody. I think they, I think they said a few words, and then there was groups in front of a. Uh, people trying to watch the news. The news came on, and if you remember, it shouldn't have been televised. <clears throat> but whilst we were getting ready to go in the building, Maggie Thatcher said we want to show the world how we deal with terrorism. Mm -hmm. So it should have been smoked off. They decided not to smoke it off. That's why you see the guys on the, on the balcony at the beginning. That was all going to be smoked off. But she wanted to show the world how we dealt with terrorism, she was the prime minister. But I'll be honest with you, it, you know, it could have been really disaster for her if it hadn't have gone right. A big disaster. But she did it, and uh, the, the guys did the job. Amazing. What changed after that? Um, what, uh, what changed for you guys as far as weapons and tactics, lessons learned, did you go and talk to the other squadrons and pass those lessons on? What uh, what happened in the the weeks and months after the operation? Yeah, um, Jack. They have I don't know what you guys call that. I can't remember. But they had a wash up. Um, and basically, all the departments that were involved put their input into it, and they have like <laughs> it's like a Chinese parliament. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, but all these departments that were involved in the squadron would have their say, and uh, and everybody would have an input. Mm. And in that wash-up, somebody puts a report together. The report gets sent round each of those departments, having taken input from each one, not one person saying it for all of them. Mm -hmm. Put that in together, a document would appear, and... If we go back to the team itself, all that kit you see on that picture behind me there, they burnt, all disappeared miraculously. They got brand new kit and equipment, they got fireproof um, coveralls, which are all wearing. Everything, you know, they, they called it Nomex, I think. Yep. And yeah, I think it was Nomex. And all this magic stuff appeared. It was all through what they class as the benchmark in counterterrorism, which was this, is where it all happened. Yeah. We did that, and everybody else got the benefit for it. <laughs> so, but that's the way it is. Yeah. You know, somebody, somebody has to be first. Yeah, that's the way it is, Jack. But that's what happened. Amazing. Yeah, we call it an AAR after action report uh, on our side uh, on our side of the pond. Um, man. That is just in incredible. And also the profile now of the SAS is, has risen. People now know who the SAS are and probably a lot of kids, teenagers want to be you. Uh, now they want to be those guys in black who entered this embassy. Um, what did it, what did that mean for the SAS being more exposed publicly? Well, <clears throat> You know, I'd been in the best part of three years when this happened, during 77. And, yeah, I'd been in there nearly, nearly two and a half years, just over. And the SAS were going along, as they normally do, out of the way, doing their job and stuff. But when this actually happened, it did raise the profile so much that even the camp in Hereford was rebuilt and security would be like you've not seen in an army camp in the UK. Mm. Everybody wanted the SAS training abroad. Big, big money spinner for the UK government. Um, so they put training teams together. With the Ju July of that year, I was in Sri Lanka training the counter-terrorist team. Everybody wanted to be trained, and of course, the British government aren't going to miss out on making a few quid. And that's what they did. You know, so there was these training teams going over all over the place from the regiment, which was there. But all of a sudden, the profile has risen quite dramatically overnight, and they dealt with it. And from that day to this, 
you know, I don't follow them a lot. In fact, I'll tell you the truth, I don't follow them at all. But from that day to this, they've gone on and on and on. And it's still, in my opinion, the best in the world. But, you know, we can all say, um, people ask me, and I still think the jobs they do are unbelievable. But, of course, every, everybody's got their own teams now. A lot of cross-training, Americans with Brits, Brits with Americans. And that was being done when I was still serving, you know, um, in different areas. And all this cross-training and stuff, ideas from certain um, countries to other countries, their ideas going back across and all this cross-training can only help, in my opinion, to make things better down the line. You know, why keep a secret from a secret from somebody who's your, your mate? Yeah. So, you know, some things you keep secret, of course you do. But actually, things like that, let's be honest, it's got to benefit everybody. Um, and, you know, I've been invited over to Texas next month. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm going to get the Texans to teach me. <laughs> All right. What are you doing over there? I'm going to do the, um, there's a conference there, the SWAT team conference. Oh, great. Down in, um, Ab near Abilene. Great. Yeah. So down there. Oh, I think I, w I was almost going to go to that and I couldn't, I couldn't make it. Uh, I would have loved yeah. to have seen you there. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm, 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 as long as nothing goes wrong, I'm hoping I, I'm the main guest speaker there. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got the presentation, a four hour slot there. To wow. Talk about Amazing. Amazing. We'll bring a lot of books with you. Make sure they have a lot of books. Everybody there should get, uh, should get your books for sure. It's so much great history in here. It's fascinating. Um, and you talk in the book a little bit about something that happened in the, the telex room and you guys had to give your statements and there was some controversy about something that happened in the telex room that you talk about in yeah. here. Some, some controversy on what, sorry. The, what happened in the telex room in the embassy? In the telex room. Yep. Um, so there's no controversy. I okay. Mean, everything's done. You know, I mean, people want to make controversy out of anything, don't they? Yes. It's been long proven that, you know, the scenes of crime were in there straight away. Um, people can say what they want, but that's just making another story. Yeah. I know, and I know the guys that I was there with, and, um, you know, controversy is one thing. It's a story, isn't it? Who, who made the story up? <laughs> but, you know, they're going to talk about it because it was a complete success. Um, so, you know, with the best best will in the world, Jack, I mean, I can talk about it, but it's not controversy. It's what's been published, what's been said. It's how people interpret stuff and want it. Mm. So let's get on with it, mate. Yeah. And what happened to the, uh, to the guy, the terrorist that lived? He went to prison. And he was eventually released. Is that right? The terrorist who survived that was captured. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the one that got out. Um, well, basically, he got out. And I still think it was like uh, Stockholm Syndrome. Mm. And, uh, you know, once he got out... He then went to prison, and I believe he spent 28 years in prison. Uh, they wouldn't deport him. So he's living in London. Okay, he's got a flat in London. And we pay him benefits. <laughs> wow. What about our soldiers on the streets? Why don't they get some money? Wow. Can you believe it? It's amazing. I hadn't followed that part of the story until I read it uh, in here yeah. and I looked up where he was today. That's, in, that's yeah. incredible. People well, that's a fact. Yeah. He spent 28 years in jail. Jeez. And if the others had given themselves up and come out, they'd have been out at the same time as him. Yeah. <clears throat> All they had to do was surrender, come out the door. Yeah. Wow. Uh, wow. Incredible. You know, that's the way it is. Yep. Yep. And you still spend another 12 years in, uh, in the SAS. Um, and you find yourself in Indonesia, 
Northern Ireland, the Falklands. Um, what in that time between 1980 and the time that you retired, uh, what stands out in your head uh, as far as your memories of that time? Falkland Islands stand out. Uh, Northern Ireland. What are you doing during these next 12 years? Um, never quite got that, Jack. What are you doing during the next 12 years between uh, Prince's Gate oh. and when you retire? Well, from the embassy. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Um, what are you doing uh, in the SAS? Are you go to Northern yeah. Ireland and the Falklands? Yeah, no. Um, well, as I say, we had the we had a cycle which would include, you know, what I talked about earlier. And that would be every six months because there's four squadrons. I will just recap: four squadrons. It would do six months on each, you know, and they would um, when the six month was up, they'd move around like a clock clockwise. One squadron would take over from another, the other would take over from the other. That would that went on for quite a while in my in my time. But you know, um it did a lot of um courses as well, you know, um paramedics, demolitions, CQB, bodyguard courses, mm-hmm. was a guard instructor for a couple of years in you know, training SAS guys. And that went on. Um all the way through trips to Northern Ireland, you know, everything that's sort of documented. And there's obviously one or two things that, you know, have to stay with us for now anyway. But that that went on, and that, that is the, the way it was in my day. <clears throat> and then, you know, the 12 years <laughs> went by fairly quickly, actually. Wow. It would have been on that cycle for most of that, but then the trips to the, the the jungles, you know, I don't know how many jungles, different jungles I've been in, you know, the, the Falkland Island conflict, um, the counter-terrorism teams, training and operational. I've worked, uh, <clears throat> I've been over with, um, spent not long with the Secret Service when I went over to Delta in the 80s. Um and <clears throat> lots of other stuff, which, you know, I haven't got time really to <laughs> it'd be until tomorrow morning. Um, but seriously, all that type of stuff was, every day was another. It, in all my time in the SAS, there wasn't a day I got out of bed and thought, I don't want to go to work today. Mm. Seriously. Because there was always something there for you to do. Yeah. Top of that, there's a lot of sport to be played as well. <laughs> which has always been one of my uh, topics of interest. So time just went on, you know, and um, finally I spent two years in two, three SAS um, as a permanent staff instructor. It was extended service. I could have gone out. Instead of that, I used that time to get some qualifications um, for Civic Street. You know, um, what we call the knee bus certificate, the all health and safety stuff, you know, paperwork, which became something you had to have, um, you know, and that's what I did. <clears throat> and finally leaving in June 1992. And to be honest with you, by then I was glad to get out. So but after 27 years, it's was fun. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. And for those that are thinking about or want to join the SAS or special operations or this next generation that's coming up, what do you, you must get asked all the time for advice or what do you pass on to that next generation that you're handing the baton to? I'll tell you one thing I'll say now. I don't know about the Americans, but the Brits. Anybody thinking of it now needs to take a long, hard look at it. Because I've noticed, it might not be a coincidence, but there's not a lot of guys who do it stay there for a long time. Mm. Because I know that it's changed from my time. And I enjoyed my time. If you ask me personally, I probably wouldn't go back in there if it was me going back that way now. Mm for a lot of reasons. 
politics are one of them, but we're not going to go down that line, Jack. <laughs> I think everybody knows, uh, everybody can fill in the lines there. I'll give, you the tr- I'll give you the truth, right? You know, if ever meet you, it might be different. But actually, I would have a long think about what's going on now and what you're expected to do and how you don't get supported, you know, after you've done your bit. Then 20, 30, 40 years, they come back for you, you know, and then hound you. And the woke brigade get out. It's a different kettle of fish now. Yeah. And I'm very about it. Well, you were there at the uh, in the heyday. You were there for one of the most significant hostage rescue operations in history. And thank you for writing these. I, I, I learned so much going through this and it's been such an honor to spend a little time with you. Um, and I hope we can meet up in person one day and, uh, share a pint. All right, Jack. Well, thanks for the invite. Really enjoyed it. And, um, let me know when the podcast goes out, mate. It's been a pleasure to come on, mate. And the hour and a bit, half four, just flown by. Ah, well, thank you so much for taking the time. And I look forward to getting that picture. I'm so excited to get that picture uh, that's behind you right there. So thank you so oh, much. That one. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll make sure you get that, mate. Don't worry. Thank Don't you worry. so much. All right, well, take okay. care and reach out if you ever need anything. <laughs> okay, cheers then. Danger Close is presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. Becoming a member at Navy Federal Credit Union could help you earn more and save more. Their certificate options earn you more than standard savings accounts with competitive rates. Not all financial institutions offer you as many choices for savings options as Navy Federal does. For example, you can start your savings journey with a low minimum deposit like $50 for an easy start certificate. Add money at any time and watch your savings grow. Thanks to flexible terms, you can use Navy Federal's savings options for all kinds of goals, short or long term. If you're saving for a down payment on a new car, you may need an auto loan at a great rate. Navy Federal is there too. Applying is easy. You can do all of it on their mobile app, online, or by phone. And it's so fast, you can get a decision in seconds. Plus, with their car buying service powered by TrueCar, you can shop, compare, and get upfront pricing on your next new or used car. Find out more at NavyFederal.org. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA, open to armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. Credit and collateral subject for approval, rates subject to change, and are based on credit worthiness. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. This is Jack Carr, and I want to talk about the Magpul DACA grid organizer. You can see it right here in this Pelican case. And if you're checking out the rifles, you might recognize them from my novels right here. This is a Galil from my last novel, In the Blood. And down here is an AK clone. It's a clone of a Tabuk Iraqi AK built by Jim Fuller of Fuller Phoenix. And James Reese uses that in the final chapters of The Devil's Hand. All right. The Magpul DACA grid organizer, specifically designed to fit two of Pelican's most popular hard gun cases, with more fitments coming soon. Magpul's DACA grid organizer is a simple drop-in storage system that allows for endless customization. The EPP grid base was designed to fit perfectly in each Pelican case and comes with a set of grid blocks that can be organized to brace and secure rifles, magazines, optics, accessories, and other gear. Right there. The lightweight EPP blocks provide advanced protection and eliminate shifting of gear during transport. The overall result is better impact resistance and stronger protection for your gear than you'll get from other foam options. Offering numerous advantages over traditional foam or expensive laser cut inserts, the DACA grid organizer provides intuitive modular organization at your fingertips. The system can be completely reconfigured without tools or additional cutting. With quick and easy adjustments, the DACA blocks, you can maximize the case's storage capacity and capability each time it's used. The grid's EPP construction provides resistance to chemical intrusion and damage, and cleanup of any dirt or liquids is easy with a damp cloth. Simple to configure, the DACA grid organizer lets you use every inch of the case to store and secure your gear the way you want. 
Use code DANGERCLOSE at magpul.com, and that's M-A-G-P-U-L.com, to receive $10 off your order of $100 or more. Offer valid only at magpul.com. Enter code in your cart and look for the apply discount code link in checkout. Cannot be combined with other offers. Once again, use code DANGERCLOSE, D-A-N-G-E-R-C-L-O-S-E, at magpul.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee Company. Grab a can of Black Rifle Coffee's ready to drink, the perfect balance of quality and convenience. If you want a Spartan level caffeine kick, try Ready to Drink 300, available in salted caramel, vanilla balm, and more. Made with an electrifying blend of MCT oil and amino acids, Ready to Drink 300 packs a caffeine punch that'll supercharge your day. Ready to drink is perfect if you need your coffee quick and shopping with Black Rifle Coffee helps give back to the veterans and first responders who serve our nation. You can stock up on cans at blackriflecoffee.com or grab an ice cold can at a convenience store near you. You can stock up at blackriflecoffee.com slash dangerclose and use code dangerclose 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. BlackRifleCoffee.com slash DangerClose for 20% off. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right, first up, Hooten Young right here. Thank you guys for these cigars. Awesome right here. Tim Young, Norm Hooten, they make an incredible whiskey. These great cigars right here, and of course... Norm Hooten, played by Eric Bana in the movie Black Hawk Down. Better known than operated. Check them out. And what's over here? Skipper's Custom Leather. Go to Instagram, Skipper's Custom Leather. And thank you so much for these coasters, this watch band on the Aries. He sent me a great belt as well. So very cool. Skipper's Custom Leather on Instagram. You can check out what he does there and contact him to make some things for you. So thank you for those. And Tacticalories, look at these right here. Man, this is the hand cannon, and this is the dead shot right here. So if you followed me for a while or seen the blog around Thanksgiving time, you know that I use Tacticalories for the turkey. And check them out, tacticalories.com. Very cool stuff over there. And Black Rifle Coffee Company, they have a sticker club as well. And check these stickers out right here, especially this one. Look at that Bronco. That thing looks familiar. Is that Evans? Hmm. Thing is awesome. So check out Black Rifle Coffee. Check out their sticker club as well. Every month you get a different set of stickers. And of course, check out that coffee. Soundless to Smooth is my favorite. And hey, my stuff right here. Uh, there's a merch portion of the website. You go to officialjackcar.com. You click on shop in the upper right hand corner. These Nalgene bottles are new on there. There's a bunch of other new stuff you can check out as well. And Ben Garwood, former SAS, he has been on the podcast before, but check these out. Look at that artwork on there. Uh, incredible. Ground Hammer and the Defenders of the Realms. We talked about this when he was on the podcast, and you can go to groundhammer.com. And I can show you the artwork in here. It is awesome. Go and pick these up, and uh, he's got a lot of cool things going on. So, Ben, congratulations. These are awesome. And... Christians in Arms sent this out. Very cool. This is a 300 PRC. I did not have a 300 PRC, and this is their Ridgeline Super Light. I'm going to throw an optic on here and maybe take it out to FTW Ranch in Texas to sight this thing in. and Or maybe I'll just shoot it here in Utah, sight it in out here. But uh, this thing is awesome. So thank you guys so much for sending this. I'm really looking forward to giving this thing a run. So very cool. All right. That is it for today. Take care out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My upcoming novel, Only the Dead, hits shelves on May 16th and is available for pre-order right now. To find out more about Rusty Furman, visit his website at rusty-furman, and that is R-U-S-T-Y dash F-I-R-M-I-N dot com. And be sure to pick up his two books, The Regiment and Go, Go, 
go. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA, officialjackcar.com. That is the website. You can click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe, be strong, keep fighting.